important point of bias, imagery and elevation data are a really useful spatial data set. They don't just let you understand what is happening, but from them we can start to unpack other relationships and ways of understanding Queensland as a whole. I'm John Tasker, I'm Acting Manager currently for State Imagery and Elevation within Spatial Information, which is in the Department of Resources. Uh, we have whole of government uh, jurisdiction in the coordination of imagery and elevation data acquisition uh, all across Queensland. And we do this through a number of programs and other activities to try and centralise and optimise uh, taxpayer expense for the acquisition of new data sets. Capture once, use many. Tonight, I want to give you a bit of an overview of our acquisition programs as a start, looking at aerial imagery, satellite imagery and LIDAR data sets. Give you a bit of a deep dive into quality assurance, uh, the often forgotten but really critical step in how we deliver the highest quality data sets for any type of use case. Give you as well a bit of an insight into some of the derived products and uses of these data sets in their different forms and finish up by talking about data access and how all of you here in person and online right, can access these data sets at no or little charge. So acquisition programs. In essence, our most critical acquisition program is for aerial photography. This one's been running for about 10, 15 years now, and is predated by a number of earlier progr programs to try and acquire aerial imagery in a coordinated manner. First of these actually started back in the 1930s. Literally, as someone had the genius idea of hanging a camera out the side of a uh, biplane and taking some photos of parts of Queensland. The earliest projects we've found to date are the Calandra Headlands, from about 1936, and we've got a project in Springfield uh, uh, National Park, well, uh, Springbrook National Park, sorry, up in the Gold Coast hinterlands that might predate that by a few years. The RAF have a few others, but as with many records that are coming up for 100 years old, uh, they're not always in the best condition and can't always be digitized. I'm really pleased to say that our subsequent records, though, particularly from the 40s through to about the 2010s, nearly uh, 1.2 million uh, aerial photos on physical film have now been digitized uh, and we're working really hard to get those out through QImetry. Nonetheless, our core program today is the Spatial Imagery Services Program or CISP. Uh, this is government, I apologize in, in advance, there will be some acronyms. Uh, if there's any that you're stumped by, just put a hand up, it's the easiest way to deal with it. CISP, CISP is our primary program. It has over 70 plus contributors, from state government agencies, local governments, government-owned corporations, and even a few startups now, all of whom put in a share of money to make the overall program work. Collectively, we get about $2.1 million, $2.5 million in contributions from each of those agencies. So for their investment of maybe $100,000, $50,000, you're getting more than $2 million worth of value. Already seeing those efficiencies as we can capture a lot more by pooling everyone's funds together. This project in program 2023 is capturing more than 330,000 square kilometres of Queensland. Now, can anyone tell me how big Queensland is in total land area? Uh, including islands around 1.9 million square kilometres. So while that is a very large number, uh, it is by no means the entire state. The way in which that program works, we'd like to capture metro areas, so Brisbane, Townsville, Cairns, Rockhampton, Mackay, every single year at 10 centimetre resolution. We get smaller towns up the east coast every three years, rural and remote towns in western Queensland every five years. We like to try and do large basin or coastline projects at about 20 centimetre, centimetre resolution, covering about a third of the entire state every five years as well. It's by no means everything, but it goes a really long way to cover 99% of Queensland's population and significant volumes of our major economic outputs, particularly agriculture and mining, and monitoring really critically the Great Barrier Reef catchments. So that's this. We'll talk about that in a little bit more detail soon. Our other two major programs that we currently run are our Coordinated LIDAR program, CLP, and our QSAT program. LIDAR is a really expensive data set. I've got some great notes we're gonna to talk to tonight about LIDAR. Uh, to break that link, LIDAR, light detection and ranging. In essence, we strap a really powerful laser pointer to an aircraft. It spins around, fires millions of laser pulses. We know the speed of light in the atmosphere. And from that, we can calculate where that laser beam's hit an object 
and where that object sits in 3D space. So using a LiDAR scanner, we can not just understand the underlying elevation of a region, but also the vegetation and other features above ground as well. Vegetation is really good because typically our laser pulse is about 20 centimeters in diameter. So it might hit part of a tree, mid-story, and the, the ground itself. And from that one pulse, we've now got three or four returns. We can start to understand things such as vegetation density or where buildings are, power lines, et cetera. CLP is currently around 6.3 million. This, this is actually an old number. It's probably more like $15 million now. Uh, this is funded through some really great work out of the Queensland Reconstruction Authority, who after the flooding that many of us experienced in 2022, went and got federal government funding to go about a new acquisition program to update our elevation data for large parts of Queensland, or for the first time ever, get LIDAR data for some areas. In the top left corner here, you can actually see this example in the Lockyer Valley. Now you'd think, LIDAR, we've had it for about 15 years, we would have done Southeast Queensland and all of the Brisbane catchment, catchment that impacts the largest population in Queensland. The reality is, above Wybenhoe Dam, we've never flown LIDAR. It's currently the best available is 30 meter pixels. By comparison, LIDAR is about 50 centimeters to a meter. So 30 meter pixels picked up by a space shuttle in 2000, the shuttle radar topographic mission. So one of the really key objectives of this program, capturing 110,000 square Ks this year, is to capture all of Southeast Queensland. So for the first time in history, we can do a whole of catchment for the Brisbane and related catchments modeling for flood events. So we're really keen to get that data set out there and we are working on ways to get it openly accessible sooner than the typical three years potentially. So coordinated LIDAR, massive acquisitions. It isn't just SEQ though. We've got companies doing work right now up in the Gulf of Carpentaria, Western Queensland, North Queensland, just about any corner of the state to bring those data sets together. Our other major program then is the QSAT program. This is for satellite imagery for internal government use. Uh, the first two have spoken about our aerial acquisition. We contract a company. We've got about six of them so far here in Queensland who we have relationships with, so we can keep the market diverse, who will go and take a plane, have their staff capture a project, process it, and deliver it to us. Satellite, and in that instance, we own that data. The state owns that as a physical asset or digital asset. Yeah. Satellite imagery is not like that. In the satellite imagery world, unless it's a large governmental program like Sentinel or Landsat, you may have heard about previously. Typically the satellite company retains ownership of that data and you can buy from them a copy of that data, typically for your individual use, or if we can get enough money behind us, use by whole of government, local governments and government owned corporations. And that's what we've gone and done with the QSAT program. This works with uh, what was a startup five or six years ago uh, called Planet. Currently, there are a few others in, in the market, the planet have over 150 satellites in orbit currently using a CubeSat about the size of a loaf of bread. They launch them up, send them all out there. And in essence, what we get is coverage of about three to four meters on ground every two to three days for any part of Queensland. So when we're looking at natural disasters, when we're looking at uh, compliance for vegetation clearing, uh, when we're looking at things such as the example here, certain mine sites in central Queensland that are somewhat controversial, we can monitor those on a real regular basis. Now I say every two to three days, there is this thing called clouds. They do disrupt that slightly, but in essence, we know we've got a better chance of seeing somewhere more frequently with this type of near daily satellite imagery. With this program, we have currently over a thousand users across government who are typically spatially based, who will access these data sets and then go and use them in a multitude of use cases. One of my favorites were our national parks rangers in Cape York, who were using uh, aerial launch incendiary devices, in essence, ping pongs with a bit of pyrotechnics on the inside of them. They would fly out over a remote national park with no major roads access, drop those ping pongs out the side of the helicopter, go check the satellite imagery two or three days later to see what had and hadn't burnt, if they had to return back to that site to try and burn a little bit more off as part of their early season uh, fire reduction burn activities. So QSAT, really critical, really useful. Uh, once again, it's focused on the GBR catchments. A really major funding pu purpose there was to make sure we've got really great mapping of the Great Barrier Reef 
and we can map things particularly around sediment loss in those regions as well. And lastly, we do a bit of internal satellite imagery acquisition as well for specific purposes. So just to see that one a little bit in more detail for you, that's 30 meter pixels from 2000 and one meter pixels from 2022. Pretty stark contrast, right? Uh, this is actually in the Lockyer National Park. So just a little bit north of Helidon. One of my favorites is you can see the main road here, which you can drive through in the sort of bottom of the image. But in the middle here, this is an area of national park. Park so there's no trails here, no access, no nothing. But there's a few historic records of gold mining and other prospecting activities back over 100 years ago. And you can see a number of trails that seem to have been cut in along ridge lines and along the creek line itself. So if anyone's up for an exploration, check out the hillshade, which is what you're seeing here. You might find some undiscovered artifacts. Yeah, I wish it wouldn't either. Sorry, we had a comment online. So talking about those, that's what on the left, 330 square thousand square kilometers looks like, and on the right, 110,000 square kilometers. So doesn't look like much of Queensland. It is a lot of Queensland when we start to talk about population and where people actually are. We also do have whole of state satellite. Uh, we had some really great funding from 2016 to 2018 to do a statewide mosaic at submeter resolution. These are all available access in tools like the Queensland Globe, but aren't available to publicly download as we sadly don't have licensing for public use. That would have more than quadrupled the overall price of the, the product. And sadly, funding is limited. We are currently underway to potentially get a new base map, but uh, that is still in its early stages. Finally, one of the other roles that the team undertakes is collaborative data sharing arrangements. It's all well and good that we can coordinate baseline capture for general reference purposes, but there are other organizations out there who are getting specific data sets that may be of value for reuse in other locations. And I've got two really good examples here on the right where we've got drone imagery of Great Barrier Reef Islands. These are really expensive to go and capture with a piloted aircraft. There's high risk of a plane going down over water and there isn't much there. I say that this is the largest green turtle nesting site in the world in Rain Island. And at certain times, those beaches look like uh, pebbles all over them because of the number of turtles. And there are some really historic monuments there as well. But if someone in national parks is going there with their own drone, flying the whole island, why don't we use that so you get one centimeter or fifth or five millimeter photography rather than a blurry image taken once every five years. So we're doing a lot of work with our national parks teams to pull in as much of their data as possible. We're also engaging with groups when they're doing broad scale acquisitions. Many of you may know of the current coal seam gas activities happening in the Western Darling Downs and throughout the Surratt uh, cumulative management area. Uh, we've worked with the Office of Groundwater Impact Assessment to release more than 25,000 square kilometers of LIDAR data and 10 centimeter imagery data the highest resolution area for those locations over five epochs to provide really great reference information that's publicly available and accessible uh, if you want to understand what's happening on those properties in terms of subsidence. So John, can you tell us a little bit more about this Office of Groundwater Impact Assessment? Where does it, is it state or federal? Uh, Ogia sits within the state government in the Department of Rural Development, Manufacturing and Water. They're a uh, somewhat separate authority, specifically tasked with monitoring groundwater in the Surat uh, management area uh, where CSG activities are occurring. Um, if you want to talk to me later, I can give you their website details and where to go and contact. Mm -hmm. uh, as well as Geoscience Australia is the last one there. They do a bunch of extra data with CSIRO and we like to pull that information in as well. Um, just to set some uh, rough numbers here, because uh, I, I do love these and it's been a bane of my existence. Uh, in to the current day, our entire archive is sitting around 1.8 petabytes of data. Uh, to break that down, you might have a, a laptop with a terabyte hard drive. Petabyte is 1,024 of those terabytes. So we've got just a few hard drives there storing all, all of that data. For reference though, uh, when I joined the team in 2018, we had 800 terabytes of data. So in six years, we've added a petabyte of new information. Uh, this is broken down over more than 25 million files, 490 elevation projects, 104 satellite projects, 
Uh, actually, as of this week, we're over 1,900 aerial imagery projects, uh, 11,000 coming up for 12,000 soon film projects, and more than 94,000 satellite scenes from the planet since 2016. So this is a record that Queensland government is storing for future use. We are under legislation required to keep it in perpetuity. So that if at some point in the future, we wanna go and access and analyze any of that to build time series, train machine learning, to derive new insights, it's there and it's available. And the investment of taxpayer dollars that have been made for that acquisition aren't just being deleted after two or three years. So this is our historic archive into the future. And if you need to find any of those projects, go to QSpatial because we've got more than 2,300 metadata records. I will dive into the access platforms at the end. Uh, so don't worry about writing down every acronym. So those are our data sets. What we want to try and do though is ensure really high quality in them so that we're ensuring that our suppliers are delivering what we asked of them and the taxpayer dollars are being spent appropriately. That's why we do quality assurance or QA. And in this, we look against sort of four main characteristics, accuracy, integrity, efficiency, and is it authoritative? So I'm gonna be getting all of you here in person and for those online, please put in a comment to try and spot some errors in the aerial photography and our LiDAR data sets. We've got two main ones I want you looking for here, visual quality and spatial accuracy. So in visual quality, we're typically looking across these four domains. Clouds and smoke, are they obscuring, causing shadows? Misalignments, are there visible seam lines where something just doesn't line up properly? Uh, or misaligned continuous features or aero triangulation issues. Don't worry about the terminology. AT is where I get one camera, second camera, third or fourth, sixth camera. And I start trying to map individual points between those photos to stitch them all together and correct for the overall elevation. Distortion, are buildings on a lean? Are our bridges warped and wavy and causing significant traffic hazard if they existed? <laughs> Have we had terrain distortions, other leaning features or really obvious manual editing? My favorite is always water where they'll copy a patch of water and just replicate it 20 times. What that ended up resulting in was 60 whales off Double Island Point. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, color balancing. Is it over or underexposed? Have we lost detail or is it inconsistent? Oh. My wonderful team put in animations and forgot to tell me. So time to test your skills. The first was really quickly check the chat if I can. Oh. We'll get to those a bit later. Okay. So I've got three examples. Can you spot the issue? Anyone want to put their hand up? Hey. Come on, oh, someone. There's a joint. Join right through the middle. Perfect. We've had an issue here where they haven't color balanced it all together. They color, color, color balanced balance. the section and then the southern section. Now, to make matters worse, this was captured in 2022 and that was captured in 2023. Normally, we ask a supplier to do everything within a month. They were capturing all of SEQ and this thing called clouds came along throughout summer and they didn't get a chance. So, one area had had rain, one hadn't. The greens were really different. <laughs> Uh, you can actually see this project now. It's in Queensland Globe. They did fix it up slightly. There's only so much you can do with three months between acquisition, though. So, yep, there we go, our alignment issue. Next up, can anyone spot oh, it? Look at this. Mm. Mm. Perfect. We have a misalignment issue. They just didn't spot it. The, the road lines had shuffled over. So we've got one photo on the right, one photo to the top left. The other one we can slightly see with the power poles is a bit of lean based on where the, the power pole is and its height. Now that is acceptable because if we were asking them to have everything perfectly vertical, it would cost way too much and the processing would take way too long. So we accept that, but not where someone's going to be driving into the wrong way. Lastly, can you spot this one? This one's a little bit more subtle. So rail track is yeah. rail tracks fine. A of... It's a standard rail track to, to a bridge. Did anyone see it? It's a wonky thing. Good. Yeah. In this example, our center line's a bit skewed, it's a bit hard to spot. This is actually because when we've taken the imagery and tried to correct for elevation, 
the underlying elevation data is a bit wrong. Normally we'll use the images themselves through photogrammetry to build that rectification surface. And in this example, there was probably a car or a truck going past and it's caused an extra bump, which has then skewed the rest of the, the lines that they've used. The worst time we see these are typically bridges over highways or something similar, where the elevation model shows up to the bridge and then down to the highway, and the whole thing leans over to one side. So this comparatively is pretty good. They did go back and fix it though. The other main thing we look at is spatial accuracy. So we want to make sure that the image is pretty much close to where it is in real life. Now, it's impossible to say that every pixel is exactly within the 10 centimeters where it is in real life. But what we do ask is that accuracy is within three pixels of reality, or at least where we know something's been surveyed to. So we thank our wonderful surveyors who go and put in permanent survey marks. Hopefully they've put in a permanent survey mark that's actually visible from the, the sky and not under a tree, like so many are. And from there, we know where a PSM is. We can try and figure out where's the, the corner of a road, features that are on the ground and can, aren't going to move with that sort of angular change. And we can verify if the accuracy is within what we would expect. So a great example, we've got our cadaster here. The cadaster itself isn't always going to be perfectly accurate. Uh, well, mind you, and they do use imagery to derive it sometimes to improve that, uh, accuracy. But a really great example of the same image in slightly different orientations. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, your fence has been in the right place. Yes, we, we do have to hope that, but we, we, we don't actually go and use the fences themselves. What we will use is those PSMs, and then you get a report that looks something like this, where you get that error margin, the root mean squared error that we've calculated based on that PSM. And as long as uh, two standard deviations worth of points, so about 68%, fall within that three pixel margin, it'll pass. The reason we've chosen two standard deviations is once again a cost to quality way off where we can go to three, about 98%, but we're going to be paying a lot more to tie it in much tighter. So Google Maps gets old, old imagery, do they? Google Maps will get whatever they can find. Mm -hmm. uh, they won't always necessarily use aerial photography though. They might just use satellite imagery. Satellite imagery does not work to these same uh, quality standards. Uh, you'd be typically lucky if it's within five to 10 meters as the accuracy margin that they will claim. They might get better in urban areas where you've got more control or validation, uh, but they, given the things flying around the earth at whatever speed, it's a little, little bit harder to tie it down quite accurately. So we're really happy with where these end up typically. And if any member of the public wants to know the accuracy details of a project, all those details you can see on the left about completeness, correctness, spatial accuracy, visual quality, and ancillary file are in the bottom of the metadata record in QSpatial. So all that information is transparent if you go looking. Uh, I know XML and the metadata files aren't everyone's cup of tea, but we're trying to increase the level of accessibility where possible for these projects. So what does this then look like in terms of products that people can use and what can we derive from them? We get our standard latest aerial photography. This, of course, is the Adani mine site midway through development captured last year. We can also do fun things like time series. Use the stack of imagery that we have to see an area as it changes through time. Can anyone guess where this feature is? It is in southeast Queensland. North Stradbroke Island. Perfect. On the head, this is the sand mining on North Stradbroke Island. We can see it progressing and then the rehabilitation work starting as that they bring in the vegetation. So really fascinating to see change and then how that rehabilitation work is actually either successful or potentially not based on what we can see in terms of the green vegetation. Now we will typically try and acquire aerial photography at a similar time each year, which will be the dry season, sort of April through to September, October. It does vary in different parts in the state when planes are available, when the, the, the weather was working, but you won't typically see a lot of aerial photography for Queensland, at least, in the summer months, just because of our weather conditions. Right. All of our suppliers fly south and go and do Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia. Then it comes to their wet seasons and they fly back north and do Queensland and the NT. Lastly, with our satellite imagery, we can start to do really interesting things with multi-band. So going beyond the visual spectrum, getting near infrared imagery, 
uh, short wave infrared and other wavelengths, or we can do interesting combinations to better visualize certain phenomena. On the right, this is a bushfire, deep water, 2018. Actually went there a couple of months afterwards seeing the uh, impact, really fascinating. What we're seeing here is a near infrared band together with red and green. So plants is your chemistry and physics lesson for the day and biology. Plants have, of course, chlorophyll. Chlorophyll together with water absorbs near infrared light differently between healthy vegetation with lots of water and dead, burnt or unhealthy vegetation. That change in the absorbance of near infrared light changes what it looks like in the near infrared band. So it's something that doesn't have a lot of water, won't absorb a lot, and we see this black color because it's unhealthy or burnt vegetation. Whereas healthy vegetation absorbs a lot of near infrared light, looks red because of the red band's getting reflected because it's a green leaf, right? That's a really rough summary, but in essence, we can see what's burnt and what's not, even after that smoke is cleared. On the left, we're using a different mixture of bands from a uh, public satellite MODIS, and this helps us visualize flood extents really well, even with high sediment loads. So this was the flooding in 2019 in Northwest Queensland. Of course, had flooding again started this year in different rivers again. At its widest point there, the water is more than 100 kilometers from side to side. And this is one of the only ways with satellite imagery at broad scale, we can actually see these phenomena and map them more accurately, even if it's at a coarser resolution. Lastly, I didn't get time to throw these throw a lot in about historic aerial photos tonight. We can save it for another time. Uh, as I said, we have more than 1.2 million aerial photos. On the left, there's the rough breakdown of coverage of that collection across Queensland and a few quick samples there on the right. These have all been digitized, get them from Q imagery. There is so much to explore there. And we are doing a lot of really fascinating work to mosaic these products together and release them alongside the rest of our collections. But it's gonna take a bit of time. Uh, with a half a petabyte worth of data to process and gigabytes upon gigabytes of metadata, it's a really complex process to go and mosaic them and ensure that they're at a level of quality to work alongside our modern digital photography. But they will come with time. So that's aerial photography and a bit of satellite. Let's go into LiDAR. So we've got a few different ways in which we also have to do our QA on LiDAR. As I said, massive program. We've pretty much had to rebuild our entire LiDAR workflows in the last 12 months to handle the novel acquisition activities that are occurring. And mainly we'll have these four key products that we're doing QA against. Our point clouds with classification and density, our digital terrain models, we're looking at the resolution, whether it's been hydro flattened, where we've taken out bridges so that the water flows properly when you run it through a simulation and hopefully models what the flooding will actually look like. Above ground structures, getting rid of those. Noise and spikes, other details that might not have been properly classified on our point cloud and any interpolation that might occur when we don't have enough points for a particular location. We can also derive contours to visualize that change in elevation and because it's a laser that's scanning, we actually get the wave, the intensity or the reflection at the specific wavelength of the laser. So we can look at the image intensity from the returns of that laser to also check that, that the data is correct. They once again animated it for me, aren't they good? Time to test your skills, if you can spot some of these problems. Okay, we've got another three or four for you here. First up, we have Medium vegetation classification points. So medium veg is, oh, testing me here, 30 centimeters to two meters. To any of those points not look like they should be medium vegetation. A few cars, eh? Yeah, good, good. We've got some cars. Anything else? Points in the road. Yep. And we have the one up here, points in our industrial buildings. Hmm. So we can see here, yes, there's a few trees. And there's also some cars that have been picked up and the roof line has also come up a few times. We're really common to happen. In essence, the way in which the classification runs is it's a really simple machine learning type process where we've told it, if this thing's boxy and you only had one return, we reckon it's either gonna be the ground or a building. If there's a really sharp edge, it's probably a building. If it's got a few points within that 
area, it's probably going to be vegetation because you, you've gone through it. So on the edges of buildings, it goes, oh, I've got a point on the ground. I've got a point up here. It's a tree. When in actual fact, it's just someone's gutter. And likewise for cars, there can be a few problems. Oh, there's the canopy cover at the bottom. So down here, this is just medium veg. We also have high veg, anything over two metres. And we will get to what a canopy data set looks like very shortly. And also, yes, the points on, on the road. Okay, once again, what's looking wrong with our digital terrain model? Really simple one. It's looking at you right in, in, in the face. Come on, Giselle, put me out of my misery. Yes, it's the big line diagonally in the middle, in, in the middle, which is a stepping issue. Water points, water absorbs our near infrared laser. So we have to do a bit of interpolation, look at the banks and try and flatten it out. What that can mean though is as a river gradually goes down hill, we get steps to try and deal with those different heights of water. Hey presto, we have a stepping issue. Now, in this instance, we want to try and fix, we want to say it's all at zero. The worst issue I've seen was in the middle of a property in the, the Darling Downs that captured two weeks apart, one week when the cotton had grown and one week after it had all been removed. Stepping issue once again, but for a very different reason. But it did help us improve the quality and try and merge things together in a better way to get a improved outcome for our stakeholder. Lastly, well, next one, contours. This one, re re really simple, really obvious. Nothing really in nature does a good old square, particularly at one meter by one meter, the resolution of our DEM. What's happened here? Contours were great till they got down to the water's edge and suddenly they've had a panic attack. And when the, the DEM has gone and done its software, it's put a contour for each individual pixel because they were all very different heights. This one, you throw back to, to, to our suppliers and we try and get that fixed. And lastly, here is our image intensity. That's that return from our laser, typically near infrared. Can anyone see where there might be the issue? Perfect. So this is where we have stretching in our image intensity. It's been too bright when it's hit that feature whether that be sunlight or between runs of the overall process. And there's a few other things that can cause that. Okay, as with our aerial photography, we do get these pretty snazzy quality assessment reports, which tell you everything you need to know about what worked well, what didn't work well. And once again, we put those really key details into the bottom of the metadata. So you can find that out for yourself before using a product. So unlike imagery, LiDAR has a lot of different products. But the point cloud by itself is a really fascinating and powerful data set, and we can derive a lot of different uh, outputs from it for different purposes. So this here, this is a web map using ArcGIS Online, and we've loaded in 50 square kilometers of LiDAR data for Southeast for, for Brisbane. So you can see here, we didn't get the size of the buildings, we've got each of those ridges on one William Street. We can go over to the Gabba, and once again, we can see the features typically vertically, and a bit of side angle, so we got a few of those building facades as well. Brisbane Convention Exhibition Centre and QPAC. There we go, some wonderful details. See, this is just the, the raw point cloud where we colour it by height, and we've added in a bit of modulated the colour based on that intensity return, so it looks a bit more like an image. Here we've got some terraced housing, individual homes, there's a church in here as well, and we've switched across now from the elevation to the classification. Red for the buildings, brown for ground, those yellowy colors for the vegetation. Once again, this is sort of a dumb machine learning process, but from there, we've now got much better information about what's a building, what's a tree, what's a bare ground, and what is potentially a road surface. And we can do a lot with that information. As we spoke about, our baseline data set is our digital terrain model. These ones are all colored based on height. So in here, we can see some of those features we we're talking about. Our, we've got a rail bridge here, or a road bridge. In our hydro flattening, we don't have the bridge, we've got what's underneath it. So that if we're doing flow analysis, hopefully it should look a bit better. You can see that here, there's meant to be a bridge through here over this creek, but the creek runs through. But all these squares that you can see are where we've interpolated because there's a building there. We know what the edge of the building is. We don't know what the height is in between. We just assume that it's flat. 
and on the right here is vegetation, where we get some more natural curves to the overall DEM. This then is our digital surface model. So rather than taking just those ground points, I've now taken the highest point per square meter. We can start to see a bit more. We've still got bare ground in some areas, but we've now got buildings in a lot more. Also got a crane here, for example, the overheads along that railway line and power lines running through our suburb. And of course, lots and lots of trees. So digital terrain model, digital surface model. Now we have a digital height model. We love putting model at the end and we do some few things in between. A DHM, I've simply taken my digital surface model and subtracted the terrain from it. So the values you're seeing here is how high is an object above ground. So now we don't just know mm -hmm. it's trees or what is buildings, we know how tall that building is, how tall those trees are based on the ground beneath them. Now there can be the odd cases where this goes haywire on a cliff face and there's a tree hanging out over the cliff and suddenly our 10 meter tall tree goes to being 60 meters tall. Mm -hmm. Thankfully we may had one or two instances and they are not the record high tree in Queensland. Just the, the, the DTM. So it's just one for one subtraction. Uh, all this is just Python code, automated, happens just as soon as we get that data through, pumps out all these products on the other end, but happy to go into more detail afterwards if you want to see the ins and outs of GDAL. So digital height model. Now we have a canopy height model. So similar process, we've just removed any point that wasn't classified as vegetation. So that medium and high veg, we now know exactly what is veg in our area. This is of course, as accurate as our vegetation classification. Most recent data sets were working really hard to ensure good veg classifications to get good products. Back to 2019 in Brisbane, we had a lot of fence lines and a lot of cars that were in medium veg, which caused a bit of noise. And you can see a few of those here where it might not necessarily be if a tree, it's probably a fence, but there are hedges. So we do have to be a little flexible. So canopy height model is really useful when looking at how green is a suburb, what is the vegetation in a particular location, and that helps give metrics, particularly to groups like Queensland Health, who have found that the newest suburbs, things like your Yarra Bilbas, your Ripley Valleys, your Ores, where they're wonderful colourbond roofs and barely a tree in sight, have really negative health outcomes because of urban heat island, but even just the amenity of people wanting to see green vegetation and trees. So mapping like this helps us understand what parts of our neighborhoods are lacking vegetation or we believe are lacking vegetation and what parts have lots of greenery to them. So can we, see- Can we have a legend on the side if we're looking at this to know the color for the height? Uh, sadly, that's just outside frame. Uh, these ones here are about 25 meters tall for reference. And lastly, there's the aerial photography if you wanted to see what it looked like in real life. So <laughs> as you can see, it's doing a pretty good job of pulling out what is and isn't vegetation. And this stuff here is probably actually really tall grass on this currently vacant lot. The other really cool product we can pull out is building outlines. We know it's classified as a building. We take those points and we try and then regularize them into squares. This typically works well because we like to build square buildings. It fails miserably when something becomes a hexagon or a circle. There is a separate process for those types of buildings, but it's really labor intensive to merge those two together. So for now, you get mostly accurate square buildings with a few weird anomalies in certain instances. And with these as well, because we know the height from our DSM or our DHM, we can put a height value against those buildings and start to understand how many stories a building might have. Is it a low set home on a slab? Is it a Queenslander on stumps? Is it a multi-story unit or, or similar? And it's this data set that is then being fed in back to our funding source in Queensland Reconstruction Authority to feed the flood modeling process. So for a individual LGA, because we know where the buildings are, we know how tall they are and the terrain that they're sitting on, how much of a building will be impacted under a certain flood event? If we get a one in 100 year event, is a building going completely under or is it just the first story? If we get a one in 1000 year event, what will that impact look like? 
So this is the really critical output from this process is the buildings and their classification against them to hopefully unpack a little bit more who and will and won't suffer at the next series of disasters. Another really fun use case is one we've been doing with the team in DES and with the team in water, where during dry conditions, hopefully, not hopefully, but likely in another two years out in Western Queensland after a few El Ninos, uh, we can go and fly LIDAR and get the bottom of farm dam storages. Now, we would of course expect that everyone's doing their very best to build their dam based on the, the plans that were approved and accepted by the, the water agencies but we, we know that's not always the case. So flying the LiDAR a few years later and we get the bottom of that dam, we can then actually do an estimate of how much water will that storage take and repeat this on the scale of hundreds or thousands of properties within individual irrigation areas in Queensland. So we've recently completed work in the Mooney catchment and the border of rivers, some of the biggest irrigation regions in Queensland. And there's some future work coming in for a few others to help support this type of work. The team's also done some fantastic work they've recently published out with CSIRO to use machine learning to then interpolate a dam if it's half full and give an approximate on what we think the storage might be. And this is all being done not off the physical data, but a web service, so a digital copy that we're delivering on the fly to them. So they're not having to store terabytes upon terabytes. It is querying the few pixels that they actually need. Okay, I'll just give you a really deep dive in all those products. You probably want to know, can I use it? Otherwise, what's the point of coming along tonight? And I'm pleased to say we have a number of methods for you to access these data sets, both for LiDAR and the imagery. A new one that we know a lot of people aren't aware of is where they can go if they need any form of baseline help. So in the past 12 months, we've commissioned the Queensland Spatial Help Centre. This is using an Atlassian product called Jira, which allows us to give you a nice search bar in a, in a browser where you can ask your question, whether it's requesting imagery data. How do I act, how do I find this certain layer? Queensland Globe's not working. Why is it a black screen? You can throw all these questions in here. We're building a large knowledge base, in essence, a large Wikipedia style collection of articles to hopefully answer your initial questions. But at the other end of this are a number of the, the team from Spatial who can send you a message, give you a call to try and debug your issue and get the right data set to you. Obviously, as I've said, imagery has a few licensing challenges. There's not, we can't do everything necessarily. The rest of our vector data sets though are almost entirely open data and you can get access, whether that be through QSpatial or other access mechanisms. And so, Elvis is still alive. Which one? Elvis is still alive. Oh, Elvis is going <laughs> gangbusters, but not that one, sadly. So. If in doubt, Queensland Spatial Help Centre, um, I can throw up a link uh, when we send through a few notes from tonight if anyone would like to see them, and they'll be on the YouTube video as well. Next one, I've mentioned it a few times tonight, oh, is Queensland Spatial Catalogue, QSC. Um, I always like to think of, we have three tiers when it comes to data access and discovery systems. At the very top is the simplified web browser or viewer, which shows you one or two layers in really good detail with a bit of a good story behind them. And they make understanding a specific data set really easy. In the middle, there are these big data access systems like Queensland Globe or National Map. They're a visual browser with some search tools to give you access to a few hundred, a few thousand layers. And you can visualize it there in the browser. At the very bottom of this pyramid, the thing that supports all of it is our data catalogs. They can be a bit intimidating. There's a lot of it written in XML and other weird structures and the search isn't the best. I know, I'm sorry. Uh, the team are working on it is all I can say. And I've been saying that for about six years. Nonetheless, QSpatial gives you access to everything that we possibly have out there. If in doubt, there will be a record for it. If you can find it, if you're having problems with finding it, you've got to do the old school, put your query in quotation marks, or go for individual phrases and go to the fifth page. If you persevere, you'll get some great results. There is some really great work going on to modernize it. We're just not there yet. Give it another 12 months. Nonetheless, for your records in QSpatial, what we're increasingly doing is providing a record per project that we acquire. And in that, if it's accessible in an open location, 
we're giving you a web link to that location. For elevation projects over the next six months, we're adding a URL, which will take you into Elvis, the National Elevation Visualization System, specifically to that project and to the area of that project. So you can download that data directly. For our imagery projects, we're trying to add in files and other information so you can pull out just that one layer if it's openly accessible. And as well, we're structuring projects in these nested groupings. So you might find a parent and you can explore its children. You might find a child, an individual project, and find out what we acquired at the same time just next to it. Q-Spatial is very useful. If you have any questions, please ask. Elvis, sadly not the, the singer, but a web browser, uh, is the best place to go if you want to download elevation data. This is a national initiative through Geoscience Australia. Queensland has contributed all of our data older than three years and increasingly our newest projects as well. Those collaborative ones I mentioned earlier, such as the project with water and the projects with Ogier are all up there for access right now. You simply navigate to your area of interest. If there is a blue box over it in some shade, there's gonna be ele elevation data available. Draw that a box over and you'll get a list like you see here on the right of who the provider is and what the products are and what their resolutions are. So in this example over Esk and Tugulua, you can see Queensland government has one meter DEMs and point clouds with the Australian height datum. If you want to visualize it, it's easy and you have a GIS, the digital elevation model is going to be perfect. If you want to start playing around with a point cloud, learning a bit of Python or downloading cloud compare, download the point cloud. But it's a file that has very specific requirements and it's not going to open in standard desktop software. GA also has some layers. Um, recently, uh, Griffith University and Fugro Roams, together with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, just released a ton of LIDAR data all up the east coast of Queensland for Great Barrier Reef catchments at 50 centimetres resolution. It has some challenges with it, but it also gives you really good resolution data for certain regions. Have an explore if you want. It's only DEMs though. So that's Elvis. We don't have an equivalent yet for aerial photography nationally, uh, but there are some conversations that are ongoing. So these are all ways to access a physical data set. As you saw at the start though, 1.8 petabytes, you probably don't wanna download that locally to your computer. You're gonna have some problems. Increasingly where we want people to go to are web services. So we take the effort of processing and packaging the imagery or the elevation data into a quick access format, cataloging it and putting it into a single URL that you can put into your GIS, whether that be in the web, on your desktop, somewhere else to access that collection of information. That's all available on Spatial Portal, but the links are also available through the Queensland Spatial Help Center. We have both restricted services for internal use, the latest available data, and public services, typically data older than three years, which you can plug into. These include cached services. In essence, we've pancaked everything into a single layer, and then we've built a pyramid. So down sampled it all the way up to the whole of Queensland view. So it's really quick. You, you put it somewhere, you zoom in, you, you pan around, it's like Google Maps, loading in those tiles as you, you go. We also have time series services where it's every possible project that's available. But you've got to pull out each layer individually to visualize it, and it's going to take a bit longer. But you are getting access to what would be hundreds of terabytes of information simply through one URL, and certainly not your internet bill being hundreds of terabytes worth of downloads. So still a really great way to access it. Um, more services are coming out very soon. Please keep an eye as something might come about that you'll be interested in. For the general person though, number one spot to go is Queensland Globe. Globe is our front end to discover more than 700, 900 different spatial layers of information right now. Go to Google, search at Queensland Globe, it'll be there. Globe also will point you to the Q Spatial catalog if you're searching for something specific and it already has time series functionality in there for the uh, imagery layers. And there's a bunch of help there as well to get you on your way. In future, a little sneak peek of what's coming. We will be releasing very soon footprint layers for our imagery and ele elevation data. So you don't have to go scrolling in and going through the time series. We're hoping to just show you some actual polygon outlines. You can click a query button and it should tell you what's available for an area. And likewise, a tool that should also be coming in the next few months is an elevation accuracy tool. So as we've said, we've got 
elevation data for all of Queensland. This tool here, though, will tell oh, you right. what the height is and what the accuracy of that height value is as well. So hoping just to improve the user experience mm. for those of you consuming data Daniel. in Huh? Sorry, Daniel. Last little plug, whilst we've got a few people talking, is our 3D services. Uh, we are increasingly working to release historic data that is 3D and modern data that is 3D. You might see these when you go into Google Maps, for example. Queensland has a few of our own data sets. We have done some of the largest in Australia. Currently, I say nine, there's actually 10 available. Uh, and these can be accessed through web GIS platforms. And in the Queensland Globe is now available as a layer. I know Brett at the back probably has a good example of that being used for a student assignment uh, to tell a story in three dimensions rather than just two. The historic ones are a lot of fun. If you do want to go exploring, pop into Globe 3D products. Uh, we've got 1961 in Brisbane. A uh, really fascinating time for, for the city, back when uh, the Eagle Street Pier was still a pier and there were still ships there unloading and loading cargo. And that should take me through to questions. Yeah, John, uh, can you indicate when uh, the government um, or the three levels of government have shifted from conventional um, contour via photogrammetry versus these new LIDAR DEMs when that turning point was because you know we've got to deal with local authority contour which we don't know what age you know when was the shift when did it happen yeah um I don't have a hard and fast rule for, for you there um the contour data and the elevation data is based on what's best available for a location uh, and as new data comes in, we will update it. Uh, and if nothing new has come in, then the historic data set is the one that will remain. Um, one of the best layers you can access, though, is there is contour data available through QSpatial. And there's some work that's ongoing to release a contour web service, uh, which will include information about the lineage, as in to which data set was used to produce those contour lines. So we're hoping to be able to provide more of that information soon. Um, if in doubt, though, contact at the, the help desk uh, and they can tell you what is the best and latest available contour data for your area of interest. Um, the elevation data that sets that we currently have are also fed through to the QTOPO team who do use the, the, the latest elevation service to then derive contours that they use in their mapping process. Um, I've searched a few states. It seems to me Queensland is far ahead of New South Wales Western Australia and probably South Australia, and I haven't looked at Tasmania or the Territory, but in terms of making this sort of data available generally, Queensland is streets ahead. Is that correct? Everyone's on their own journey uh, when it comes to <laughs> releasing elevation data sets, and each state has different reasons and timelines for when those things have gone out openly. Uh, both Victoria and New South Wales have done some great work in recent years to open up a lot more of their data sets and they're now pushing us in terms of queries coming through as I see Victoria's doing it, why aren't you? Um, other states though, there are still financial reasons as to why data sets are not made openly. Western Australia and Northern Territory are great examples uh, where for those mapping agencies to continue operating, they need a way to fund their activities. Uh, but yes, we've been very lucky with the open data policies of recent years to be able to release as much as we have and hopefully provide benefit to the people of Queensland. This is spilled over, to, in my mind, to uh, geological information, uh, natural resource information generally. Queensland just seems to be so far ahead in terms of the searches I've done, it's not funny. The, the one to go looking for, if you do want more geo-related data, there's been a fantastic project through the Geoscience Data Modernisation Project, uh, which is its own discovery platform and portal. Uh, and that gives you access to scanned reports of uh, exploration activity, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, GeoRes Globe is terrific. Yes, and thankfully we, we've been able to leverage the Queensland Globe to make GeoRes Globe quicker and cheaper mm -hmm. and use a lot of the underlying identical infrastructure. Question here. Person asked that they do that, or have you got other programs that can go through and pick out areas and then assess it? So, 
it's a mixture of both. Um, it's part of the reason why we have to have a team to do the QA work. Uh, we know that a lot of work has been done to try and build machine learning algorithms to do this. Yeah. Uh, and the past five years really need to give full credit. You've heard from, from me here, I have a team of 16 staff that, that help with all, all of this. We're one of the largest imagery and elevation teams in Queensland or in Australia. Uh, and it's without their work, none of this would, would be happening. They've done some great work in the past five years where we've had uh, more than quadrupling of data acquisition and a reduction in staff numbers to deliver upon better efficiencies. And a lot of that's automated processing. So baseline file checks and quality checking is all done automatically. The only things that are still human based are that visual quality check and that spatial accuracy check because you're having to tie something physically. But a lot of those um, visual quality checks of the discontinuities or the misclassifications, uh, we know of some companies that invested millions of dollars and after all that effort in 12 months had nothing to actually show for, for their work that improved the accuracy beyond and cost beyond just doing it manually. Uh, yeah, it, it can get a bit laborious. Well, that's why, why we like to give them other projects to uh, keep them fresh and not completely brain dead from staring at points all, all, all day. Yeah. Uh, but that is also a mixture of what our team does to QA the data and what these suppliers have to do on their end to deliver a good data product. John, your, your um, data is invaluable in the classroom for me. How do, um, is it accessible? Is the, the Brisbane 2019 LiDAR and the Canopy Light, I saw the Canopy Lights were available. So they're freely available now. Um, Send me a message okay, uh, and we'll see what we can do with the canopy heights. Uh, 2019, there is something I, I can do. The more recent, we've still got it locked up under licensing. Yeah. Uh, we are actively looking now at a public version for CHM, but that's not available just yet. Uh, likewise, some of those other products that we mentioned, like the DSS. How do we find out as educators when that becomes available? Because that's just invaluable in my classroom. Perfect. We have a mailing list. Uh, um, once again, if anyone wants that, come see me afterwards. I can give you that, 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 those details. Um, we might send an email out to all, all attendees if that makes it a bit easier. Um, that mailing list is great to subscribe to. We have a restricted one for internal updates and a public one for public updates. We send things out for public probably every three to six months and for internal every two to, to, to one month about what's been released, what's available, any updates where other acquisition programs are occurring. So that is the easiest and best way. Uh, and it also means that in future, when we're running surveys about how people are using these data sets and what they want to see more or less of, you can provide that valuable input. Perfect. Question over the back. In the past, uh, various government departments have commissioned imagery and LIDAR. Have you acquired this and is it incorporated in the data sets? Where are uh, we're in a really lucky position. We are seen as the leader for the state for these activities. So a number of agencies do come collaborate with us where they bring the funding, we bring the expertise and we deliver a project together. There are a number of projects though that have been done by individual agencies and where possible, we, we, do, we do reach out to them after the fact if we've found it somewhere else and try and get a copy, integrated and distributed in our standard mechanisms. It hasn't always happened, but that's part of our ongoing uh, collaborative data sharing work to open up as much as we possibly can and to hopefully provide a historic record. A really great recent example of that is Norfolk Island. Um, who knew that Queensland is now responsible for the schools what and hospitals on Norfolk? Obviously, um, Norfolk's going to be really expensive for us to try and acquire because it's further away from us than it is from Nimea and New Zealand. Thankfully, though, back in 2019, the CSIRO and the Parks Group in Federal went and acquired a sub-centimetre imagery data set and a really high point density LIDAR data set. We managed to get in contact with them after Queensland took over jurisdiction and we are doing work to integrate those data sets so that our uh, Queensland Health and Ed, and Ed Queensland can access those for asset management on those sites. So we do reach out. Uh, there are still some areas though that are a little bit more protective of their data sets. Uh, and it will take a little bit more convincing to try and unlock those a bit more openly. We might dive to some questions online before coming back in person, and then we might wrap up. Uh, Stuart's asked the question, LIDAR coverage over SEQ, Southern Downs region, are we in SEQ? I'm sorry to say Southern Downs doesn't count as SEQ. That's not to say we're not doing data acquisition. You did get flooded in 2022, 
So there is a bit of work going on right now for Southern Towns Regional Council, uh, including some projects around Stanthorpe uh, and a few of the other centres. Um, if we have it, we will be making it available as, as we, we can. And thankfully, the Water Department is doing some more in that region, hopefully, very soon. Um, do resource companies pay Queensland Government for this data given the limited budget? Uh, yes, if anyone wants the data under them less than three years old, they have to pay. Uh, you can check the website for what that dollar value is. Uh, private corporations are included in making those payments. Uh, and in some instances like that data for the uh, Condomine and the Surat CMA, the resource companies acquired that themselves and they've had to give that and openly license it uh, to the rest of government as part of the transparency measures under legislation. I've got a comment here from Ronwin, uh, postgraduate archaeology at UNE, uh, talking about founder fossil. So please check that when I went out, anyone who is interested. Uh, and then can we get access to LIDAR in Esri for free? Uh, you can get access to the public service. Uh, the restricted service, as the name suggests, is, is restricted. Uh, and that's simply because we are trying to, hopefully, Queensland didn't have had about five years of no funding for LIDAR acquisition. We're trying to use this initial uh, bit of funding to hopefully restart interest and continue an ongoing program uh, that can keep LIDAR acquisition occurring across the state so that we all have the best available data moving forward. Why was there a gap? It sounds like a specific area that's not enough to fund. There are a lot of things the government has to fund uh, and sometimes data acquisition is not the highest priority. I'm sure if you want a school or a police uh, station or no. medical care, right. uh, that, <laughs> that might take a bit of priority. But it, as always, part of the biggest piece of work that we do is finding those use cases and justifying why we need to spend uh, you know, a few million dollars here and there to update. And there's, all, there's regularly the question of, well, we captured it once, it, it shouldn't have changed too much. Um, do developments in floodplains might uh, beg to differ though. Question here? Can you explain the sharing of data? Someone mentioned earlier, like Google, do they, if it's open access, do they go and take some of it and put it through their own or is that We found Google likes to use their own data because uh, they have full control licensing, et cetera, in that workflow. Um, there are some examples, uh, Esri, as mentioned earlier, the Microsoft of spatial, as we like to say, uh, they made a deal with Morton Bay Regional Council who co-purchased one of our imagery data sets and it went in, into Esri's and they got free access to, to a bunch of things for contributing in data. Um, as data sets go out open, we put them under licensing terms. If someone's use is within those licensing terms, they're more than welcome to use it. For most of these data sets, that is Creative Commons attribution where you can use it uh, and you just have to attribute who the data source was, i.e. state of Queensland, year. Um, there are some data sets we have, some from Natural Disasters, for example, which are Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial, uh, NC, where, as the name suggests, it can't be used for commercial purposes. But NGOs, members of the public, of course, have easy access. And the reasoning for that will typically be around it's satellite data, we don't own, own the IP. Uh, we do have some drone data sets. Uh, we, we are working to release more drone data sets uh, where parks probably have some of the best available data. We are working uh, with Karen Joyce and the team out of JCU on their, with their Geo Nadir platform, uh, which allows you to publicly release out frames and, and, and the mosaics. So search for imagery and ele elevation Queensland government and you'll see the projects we've got in there so far. With their private company. Uh, no, no, that's a public, uh, freely accessible platform to deliver our uh, data under CC by licensing. Cool. Final question up the back here. You probably just answered that. I was going to ask, is there a way to get data flowing the other way? Like if we do little search projects and create aerial imagery or LIDAR data, is there a way to submit that to Queensland Lab and make it publicly available? Come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> right. We'll see what we can do. But yes, we have had a few queries in the past and we're really uh, keen to have the conversation. The main one is just about volume and uh, alignment with our data specifications and rough requirements. Cool. If there's nothing final there, everyone, we might wrap up for, for there. Thank you all for coming along, asking some tough questions. Uh, and I hope you've learned a lot from tonight's presentation. Uh